What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Fantasy Files podcast, where we talk about our favorite fantasy series and topics. We are your co-hosts, Spencer and Gabe, and today we are chatting with Zach Argyle about his Threadlight trilogy with his newest and final installment, The Bonds of Chaos, having just been released. We'll introduce Zach in just a second, but first, if you enjoy hearing our pitch perfect voices and watching our angelic faces on YouTube, then smash those like and subscribe buttons because that is the best way currently to support the channel. We would love to hit 400 by the end of the year and we hope that we earn your subscription today. Also, remember that every time you hit those like and subscribe buttons is another day that Gabe gets his ration of bread and Bud Light while he (laughs) endlessly toils away digging a hole out of my basement. (laughs) He he thinks he can get out. Uh, So do the right thing. (laughs) We also we also have a Discord and a Twitter that is linked below in the in the description. So feel free to check those out if you'd like to continue the conversation there or in the comments below. Uh, we'll do a spoiler-free discussion talking about Zach's journey as an author so far, and then we'll kind of dive into full spoilers later on, but we'll give you fair warning beforehand. Um, If you haven't read the Threadlight Trilogy yet, be sure to check out my spoiler-free review, which should be posted either right before or right after this episode goes up, um, so you can kind of get an idea for what the series is. Um, With all that out of the way, let's introduce our guest and talk about what we've been reading lately. Uh, So, Zach, who is your daddy and what does he do? (laughs) <laughs> my father's name is thomas <laughs> he's an accountant and he told me to never become an accountant <laughs> and so i didn't <laughs> uh no i uh yeah so I'm, I'm zach i grew up in the seattle area and just moved back a couple years ago happy to be back nice. uh, which is actually how i first came to to meet these two clowns yeah so, uh, excited about having some local folks nice. and uh yeah, I, I write uh, what I call lightweight epic fantasy. There you go. Lightweight, physically lightweight, because the books are like <laughs> under 400 pages each. Yeah. Um, but still with the expansive world building and, and mm-hmm. you know, all that fun stuff. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And where can people follow you? You can follow me uh, pretty much anywhere. I'm on Twitter. I am SFF author. I'm on Instagram at Zach Argyle author. I got a Facebook page, website, Sweet. newsletter. We had we had Nicholas Eames on uh, I think a couple weeks ago, and we asked him like, "Where can people follow you?" And he like gave a a street. Is <laughs> like, oh, I'm usually walking down like fourth around noon. <laughs> yeah. like... <laughs> Nicholas is the best man. Yeah, he's awesome. Um, so Zach, have you, uh, you know, have you been able to read anything lately, or have you been busy writing, or have you been able to watch anything? Yeah, so I. I kind of took a break from writing for about three months after I released Bonds of Chaos in August. Cause I was just like, I just need a little break. And mm-hmm. so I, I did do some reading. I did some, some watching. Uh, I will say, so I, first off, I'm currently reading uh, of darkness and light by Ryan Cahill. Oh, it's a uh, book two of the bound of the broken series. Yeah. And it's a very, very long book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very good, but yeah. I'm also on like page 600 and I'm like, all right, man. Yeah. Let's let's uh, let's go. Let's, let's yeah. Get on to my next book. <laughs> yeah, I love you, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> and his next book is going to be even longer. So I'm like, dude, come on. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> to me. I know. Yeah, that that series. I I read the first one and I I enjoyed it, but I was like, dude, that was like 35 hours of an audio book. That <laughs> yeah. was that was wild. And uh, and so I've been really really hesitant to pick up the uh, the next one because I know they're all big chunky boys um and then you have thomas howard riley have you have you read we break immortals <laughs> no isn't it like over a thousand pages or something dude like? i i wish i wish i had it up on my shelf up here it's like it, it's like a huge like just thick thick book and i i'm already like a slow physical reader which is why i do a lot of audiobooks um it took me i think two two and a half months 
to to read that whole <laughs> book. And like I and I read it like every night, like every single night. I religiously sat down and read that book. It still took me two and a half months. Um, Ooh. and so you know, there's I, a reason for this, by the way. Huh? Indie authors get paid better for writing longer books. Oh, really? I wouldn't have thought that. Right, because what people don't know is like the majority of indie author income comes from Kindle Unlimited primarily. Mm. And the longer your book is, the more money you make because you get paid per page, page read. Right. Oh, yep. whoa, I didn't even know that. And then yeah. the second one is audiobooks. People don't like spending their audible credits on shorter books. That's why I haven't read it, Cradle. Yeah. 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 It, does, it doesn't feel like you're, you know, getting your money's worth. Yep. And yeah. So longer books obviously like cost a lot more to publish it. But yeah. 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 That's interesting. That's the difficult thing. I was I was talking to him the other night. Um, we uh, we were talking about uh, the Kickstarter that I was I had mentioned to you, trying to see get a feel for how we could do it and whatnot. Um, and man, some of the pricing for for the size that that book is like, man, it's like nine grand for for that audio book for a like, mid range narrator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's a big. That'd be like a forty hour audio book probably. Um, but, uh, but yeah, anyway, I, uh, when I was talking to him, he was saying that his second book is at least 15% longer. And I was like, I was like, dude, I'm not going to be guys, able to, man. I'm like, I'm not going to be able to keep up with these. If I can't get an audio book, like I gotta get, I gotta be able to listen at work. I'm not going to be able to read your book in a decent amount of time. Do you know, do you know Andy Poloquin? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's, he's doing the same thing, man. His, his assassin books, his new one, he just told me is he just got like 375,000 words or something like that, Whoa. which the entire Threadlight trilogy is 300,000 words. Wow. <laughs> and so this is like book six in his series is significantly longer than my entire trilogy. Wow. Like, how, how do you do that? He's like, yeah, well, that's gnarly. The story required it. And I'm like, you're in charge of the story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're making the decisions. Yeah. <laughs> What were the first couple of, what are they called? The night blade books or something like that? Dark were, blade. Yep. Dark blade. Were the, were the first couple ones that long? Cause I thought those were, I, I've never read them. Not that I, long. They're, yeah. they're long. I think, I think they're like 600 pages or something, but oh geez. Yeah, yeah. They're not this, that one's going to be like, you know, 1300 pages or something. Jeez. That's wild. All right. So Gabe, have you, uh, we, I know we talked about this a little yeah. while ago, but have you read anything? So other than the stuff we read, we just read Gleanings, a uh, sh short story conglomeration from Neil Schusterman, which is awesome. Of course, The Threadlight, uh, The Last Bonds of Chaos we read. And then other than that, you know, I I didn't I didn't really have the money to buy credits. Mm -hmm. And so I was just going back and kind of rereading some stuff. There was a series that I read a long time ago that was a lit RPG series. And it's been like it's been like eight months and so i was like that's a perfect thing to go back to so i started that again because i had them all saved it's nice. called life reset it's a good good lit rpg story and other than that not much man okay Z zach have you read any lit rpg i've read a couple uh not like the most popular ones i read a couple just from friends that have written them yeah i think i've read three okay and uh, the most recent one i read is called uh, pantheon den of thieves by s.a klopfenstein Okay. It was actually really good. It's like Assassin's Creed inspired. Oh, cool. It's like a it's like a mix of like Assassin's Creed and like The Matrix kind of. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm always yeah, looking for new. Cool. There you go, Gabe. Right, Lit write RPG it down, to read yeah. for sure. Wait, okay. Pantheon. I'm I'm actually gonna write it down. What's it called again? Pantheon. <laughs> Pantheon, Pantheon Den of Thieves. Okay. Yeah. Pantheon Den of Thieves. Got it. Yeah, Lit RPG is like Gabe's favorite subgenre, and I don't like it yeah spencer can't <laughs> stand it <laughs> dude that genre is hot man it is like if you're I'm, an indie I'm, author and you want to make money ooh, write it yeah write a lit rpg man yeah i'm, I'm just get consumed yeah that's funny yeah i uh so i i have read so many books lately like in the past few weeks i've i've listened to more books than i i thought i could in a single like <laughs> period of time <laughs> um so i um it so this whole i i'm kind of on like this very specific horror kick um i was playing fallout 4 Halloween. i've i've yeah. been playing i've been playing fallout 4 like religiously every single night putting like hours and hours and hours into it and yes. one of the one of the dlc um it's kind of a 
it, it takes you to like this island and it's almost like Lovecraftian. Um, and you you go in, there's like this seaside town where not everything is what it seems to be and everybody's really sketchy and you're trying to get like information and you're fighting like these Lovecraftian kind of uh, kind of monsters and stuff. H have you played Far Harbor, Gabe? The yes. Far Harbor? Yep. Yeah. So, um, so I, I started getting into that DLC and I was like, I want to read this book. And yeah. so I I started I started looking into like horror books that are set in like weird towns or uh Lovecraftian type stories or horror books that are set in like specifically seaside towns. Um and so I read Bone White by Ronald Malfi, which was uh I I I think so far I've never really gotten scared by a horror book. But this one like legitimately like creeped me out. I, I had to like institute a rule where like I didn't listen past a certain time of night <laughs> yeah. because like, dude, I was I was hearing just like normal like house sounds and I'd be like, I'd like look out my door and stuff because just like the whole atmosphere of the book at, at yeah. certain points was so creepy. There's a kid that wears a sheep's head. I mean, it's terrifying. Whoa. And so, so, um, so yeah, anyway, that one that one really tripped me out and then I found one that was like exactly the genre, the subgenre or trope or whatever that I was looking for. It's called The Netherwell Horror and it's very Lovecraftian. Um this girl in I think London or something uh gets a a call from a payphone. Uh like someone calls her from a payphone. And it turns out to be her brother. And he leaves a message that's like, come help me. I, I need help right now. I'm in serious trouble. He's like, I'm in this town of, of Netherwell Bay. So she tracks down the call to like where exactly the, uh, the, the phone booth was and everything and kind of starts investigating this town. And it's very, very creepy town. Like everybody has something to hide. Uh, nobody's telling her like what's going on. Very much like Bone White. Um, and it's just set in like this really gloomy beach. People are showing up dead on the beach. Um, and then it becomes uh, substantially more, as the book goes on, it gets substantially more and more Lovecraftian. Um, and I, I really enjoyed it. The, the dialogue is, is kind of clunky at times. Um, there were some times where I kind of like rolled my eyes a little bit, but for the most part, good book. I'd recommend it. Um, and then I actually dived in to H.P. Lovecraft. For the first time i uh i've i've never i had never read any of his works but gabe and i just downloaded um this app scribd to listen to to bonds of chaos yeah. and nice. um and there's not there's actually not a whole lot of like other fantasy on there but there's a lot of horror stuff like all of dean Koontz's books are on there um, a lot of stephen king books um and so i just looked up HP Lovecraft to see if any of his stuff was on there. And I read um, Shadow Shadow Over Innsmouth, I think is his most famous like kind of entry point into Lovecraftian horror. Um, and that one was actually really creepy at, at certain points as well. And I I was worried that I wouldn't like it because it's so old. Um, but it felt, you know, just the same as anything else I would read. So I, I really enjoyed it. That's awesome. Have have you read any Lovecraftian type stuff, Zach? I have not. No. Okay. Me neither. Yeah, it's it's something that I I kept seeing people talk about, and then as as soon as I played that Fallout Four DLC, I was like, okay, I gotta. Well, and and, and he's soul. like the the OG of like that kind of genre, right? Like it's he's the yeah, one like, that started that. Like seaside celestial horror. Something. <laughs> like yeah. C C Cthulhu and all that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> You know you're legit when you get like a whole like subgenre named after you. Yeah, for real Love, Lovecraftian. Lovecraftian. Yeah, yeah for <laughs> yep. real. So cool. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I don't know. I don't know where else to put this. I don't know what other episode to like put this in. <laughs> so I mean, since we're all just hanging out, yep. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this. Okay. So, you know, Gabe, you and I were talking about uh about Bleach earlier. You're talking about the yep. anime Bleach. And it made me think of, were, were you guys ever like big fans of, of Pokemon back in the day yeah. at all? Okay. I, I think that was maybe 
I, I've seen some, but my thing was Dragon Ball Z. That's that's okay. what I watched, I think, in place of Pokemon. Okay, that's Could fair. Can I still tell you the evolution of any of the original 150? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Okay, nice. Yeah, see, I wasn't... Uh, when I was a kid, I watched, like, the first season or the first, like, two seasons or whatever, and then kind of, like, fell off as I got into, like, junior high and stuff. And, and then I just never really like picked it up again, but I, there's this thing that for the past, like 25 years, the main character, Ash, he's never won, like, like from the beginning, his whole goal was to be like the very best, right? Like the world champion. I want to be. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Be best. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he never did it. There was never a season where he won like the world championship. Um, and so I'm dicking around on twitter the other day <laughs> and i see this tweet where someone posts a screenshot whatever like the newest season in japan is uh journeys i think it is uh ash finally became like the world champion and i didn't realize like <gasps> i know right <laughs> yeah and like i i did not realize what a big deal this was although i was kind of like oh that's cool because i knew that he had never like done that before so I start going down this YouTube rabbit hole. And like I said, I'm not like the biggest fan of Pokemon, but I love fandoms. Like I just love, I love people who are like just the biggest fans of something. And I'm going down this YouTube rabbit hole and there's just all these Pokemon fans that are just losing their shit and it is so it was just like so heartwarming like people are like watching the episode and just like crying on camera oh my gosh and i'm like dude, happened. I'm yeah like, i'm like dude that's that's so awesome i'm so like i'm so happy for them <laughs> for ash so happy for ash finally yeah. so are, <laughs> are they gonna change his name now is it gonna be ash caught him caught him oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh. Uh. Yeah, that's so great. I was just like, I commented on some of the some of the YouTube videos. I'm like, I'm just happy for you. Like, I'm <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just yeah. happy you got to experience that. You're finally a winner. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I think we own probably like two dozen Pokemon books. Oh, I nice. Really? I, I have a I have a seven year old son, and yep. they have like these <laughs> early reader like chapter books for Pokemon. And they're basically just like retelling episodes of the actual show. Cool. Oh, but we've got we've got a bunch of them. Man, he he loves those. That's awesome. Oh, cool. Yeah, I would probably like those too. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know there was actual like novels. I assumed there was like comics or something, but that's crazy. Yeah. Oh, have you guys heard of On Lavender Tides? No. No. It's a it's a book inspired. It's a progression fantasy inspired by Pokemon. What? And so it's like very similar. Yeah. It's a Travis. Can't remember his last name but okay indie author on yeah, it's, supposed lavender to be, it's, really, it's got a really really pretty cover too okay. cool on, on lavender tides yeah on lavender that, tides that's all you gabe yep exactly yeah, we, progression fantasy that. it's my ball game <laughs> he just started reading cradle i did how how far nice. are you now um i'm like book book four i think okay you still um, liking it but i'll be on yeah i'm I'm liking it. I just needed a break. That's why I went back to that other thing. That's because it's like, and here's my here's my issue. So I read this lit RPG. Yeah. I didn't really think it falls into that genre. It's much more progressive fantasy, but it's called He Who Slays Monsters. Yeah. So I read the whole entire thing. The next book comes down to December, and Cradle is like just a not as good version of that book. Oh, really? Like everything is the same. Oh, except for like the story, all of the ranking system, all of the powers, all of the way they get stuff is like literally the same thing. But he who slays monsters does it better. So I was just oh. like, I, this is just not it for me. Oh. Fighting words. I know. Yeah. I know. I'm sorry. Like <laughs> yeah. I might piss some people off, but that's how I feel. You know, <laughs> yeah. I heard that like book four was where it started to get good. But you said you've already read book four. So let me see. Maybe I did. Maybe I only made it to three. I got them right here. I've only read the first two and I thought both of them were they were good. Yeah. Like very, very easy to read, very bingeable. Um, but then people are like, oh, you got to get Yeah, so I only made it to read. number three. Okay, so I yeah. finished book three. Yeah, try and so it. All right, maybe yeah. I have to give it a shot. Yeah, try try four, because I've heard the same thing. I've, I've okay. heard it gets significantly better. Because it's like, I still like it. Like, I yeah. don't want to say that. Like, it's still super entertaining, and I enjoy the way that it plays out. I just, I don't know, needed a break, I it, guess. It, I, I would imagine that it probably splits off 
somewhere yeah. at, at some point it's got to become its own thing i would imagine yeah. i think that's about it for me fallout pokemon hp lovecraft horror. there you go and, andor no one's going to mention andor and oh, how good it ha- is have you been watching andor i've wanted to oh have neither of you watched it um, i i don't even know what that is it's the new <gasps> star wars show Dude, yeah it's i have actually so good really okay really yeah like surprisingly and okay. I haven't really liked like Mandalorian. I thought it was fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it had good moments. Because I, I like the Mandalorian. I haven't liked any of the other stuff. Yeah, I heard that Kenobi. This one is trash. so good. Yeah. Oh, cool, it's dude. Really good. The writing. Oh my gosh. Where do you? It's, is it Disney. on Prime? Is Prime the way to watch it or Disney? Disney Plus. Disney yeah. Plus. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Disney has all the Star Wars That's right. and Marvel yep. and all that nowadays. Yeah, it's gonna be twelve episodes, and I think they have ten out right now. Oh, oh cool. Left. I love it when I get Those... onto the game when there's still 10 episodes in front of me. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. After episode three, you're going to be like, okay, I'm totally sold on this show. Oh, cool, oh, dude. Okay. I'm going to watch that tonight. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I definitely got to check that out. I still got to finish House of the Dragon. I'm on, I'm on episode like, I think the next episode I have to watch is episode seven. Of I haven't House seen that either. But... <laughs> Dude, speaking of fantasy TV shows, sorry, I know this is a tangent, but real quick, Zach, a, a while ago, you put up this video that made me laugh so hard, <laughs> and it was it was right after uh, it was right after um, Jesus, the Wheel of Time had the final episode had aired, and it was just you like walking down your hallway, and you were like, <laughs> you're like, you're like Hillary and I just watched. Uh, the final episode of Wheel of Time. That's exactly what you're talking about. And, and then you like lean in the camera. You're like, and she's so pissed. And you like turn <laughs> the camera, and we could just like see her and like she's that. sitting in this chair yeah. recording her video, <laughs> just like ranting at the camera. <laughs> and I I have to ask you because like <laughs> seeing that video, like it it like in my head, like I have a head cannon of that moment, right? Where like <laughs> you guys like watched the episode and it wasn't even a minute before she like got up she's like i gotta talk about this and just like went to the <laughs> is that how it happened oh yeah i mean she does that like all the time so she did that a lot with that show she does it with andor she'll jump on her instagram and do a story like we'll just be like laying on the couch and like she'll just show both of us and we're like oh my gosh this show is so good <laughs> yeah. it's so much better than the other shows nice <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I uh man, I I absolutely cracked up at at that video cuz like <laughs> I I was I was waiting for everybody else to be like, "Oh, this show sucks." Like cuz I and I know people don't like this. I know that I'm I'm the bad guy. I get it. But like I was the one from the beginning that was like this show sucks. Yeah, from and, from the first episode, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> like when it came out, Spencer was like, "Don't watch this." And I was like, "Well, I I haven't read the books." Will I like it? And he's probably, yeah. Yeah, if, if you haven't read the books, I'm you might, but like maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe. I still don't but think like, it was a good show. Okay, yeah, even that's fair. E- even near the end, yeah, I I was, yeah. By the time by the time it got to episode five, I was like, oh yeah, this I I actively hate this. And, I tried uh, so hard. There I know was, there, there was moments of of like things that I was just like, oh, this could be really good. Yeah, like they could they could really make this work, and, then, and they nope. didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, did do a lot of people like it? Like, was it just a failure all around? I, I like, is feel... there like a following? Because I'm like, man, they have spent there... so much freaking money on that show, dude. Yeah, well, it was it was probably a better success than the Lord of the Rings show was, but like, there there is like a stan following. Of, okay. Of Wheel of Time, yeah. but I. I kind of don't know if they're real Wheel of Time fans, honestly. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I know no, people okay. who've read the books pretty much <laughs> don't. Yeah, it. that's what I've heard. Yeah. That's what I've yeah. heard. Yeah. But we have friends who haven't like who don't really read any fantasy, but they yeah. like fantasy shows. Yep, right. and they're like, oh yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, they, yeah. They're like, uh, maybe I'll watch season two, maybe not. I don't know, but right. Yeah, I that's the like the general both. consensus that I've heard is people yeah. that haven't read the books have a chance at liking the show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they have a chance. They have a chance. Uh, how about that Witcher news? Oh my god! I haven't heard Ooh. that either. That's so sad. They they Henry Cavill is out. He he didn't like the 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 rumor is that he didn't like how the writers were handling the show, and he's like a big fan of the books and the games. Um, and they were kind of doing some weird stuff with the with the lore and and the the plot. Um, Have you watched they've, that? They've already Zach? recast him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Liam's Hem- Liam, Liam Liam Hemsworth. Hemsworth. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, 
that's not the worst you could get. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not like, the worst, not the best. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I guess. Yeah, I I think like I if I'm if I'm really honest about it, like looking at Henry Cavill and looking at Liam like side by side, I'm like, there's there's something here. They they have like you know similar like facial structure. I think that Liam could pull it They're off. They're both handsome white dudes. Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> With six pack abs. Yeah. yeah. But uh but you know Henry Cavill is is Henry Cavill. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's there's iconic. Yep. Yeah, you know. All right, let's uh let's get to the let's get to the show here. We got a <laughs> <laughs> spoiler free discussion for the Threadlight trilogy. Zach, do you want to do um kind of like an elevator pitch for either Voice of War or like a spoiler free like series pitch or whatever sure yeah so I, for epic fantasy series and books in general i think it's kind of hard to do like a summary of it yeah mm-hmm. right like if you're trying to like talk about like what is the way of kings about <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah Bunch of people in a cool world doing yeah. stuff yep. <laughs> yeah yep. so i always have a, such a hard thing. time with yeah. elevator pitches man yeah that's, that's why fair. i just i stick with the tagline uh, which is kind of what I what I started out with when I started writing the series, which is their child will save the world if they can keep the damn kid alive. Yes. Okay. And so it yes. originally was it started like the idea started out as like you know you, you got the chosen one trope, but I was like, what about the parents of the chosen one? Yeah. Like, what if it's like a baby and they gotta like keep it alive? Yeah. <laughs> like that sounds that sounds fun. <laughs> That's kind of how it started. That's awesome. Yeah. There's a. Uh... There's a lot of like, um, I noticed a lot of like Mistborn and like Lightbringer kind of inspiration. Were those kind of like what you saw for the magic system? Yeah. So I, it's interesting because the Lightbringer one, I actually, I didn't think about when I was, oh. when I was oh, building really? it. Um, but I think just like the colors and stuff, people were like, oh yeah, I definitely see yeah. the Lightbringer. Yeah. Um, but the implementation of it, I think is pretty different. The, oh, yeah. the Mistborn one is pretty, pretty clearly similar. Sure. Uh, especially at the start. And that was basically what happened is like, I, I had the idea for this magic system where like, you are connected to everything in the world. And I was like, and there are people who can see the connections. Mm. And so then when I started like creating the magic system, I was like, well, what are these, what, are, what can these people do with those connections? Yeah. And then obviously like there's misborn influence with like allomancy and, you know, pushing right. and pulling on metals. And I was like, okay, well they could push and pull on these threads. Yeah. Uh, it's not metal. It's just kind of like, you know, anything. Right. And, I was like, and then there's also this, core thread beneath them that like is gravity holding them to the earth right and they can push or pull on that yeah and so that's kind of where it, where it started off there and definitely mistborn inspired uh the original mistborn trilogy is is my favorite trilogy of all time yeah i think the ending yeah. is just a masterpiece yeah have you read uh era two i've read yeah all of them except for the new one that's coming out yeah uh, it's been a while and i don't remember everything that happened so I'm gonna have to definitely do some recaps before that comes out. It's like a couple days or something. That yeah, comes it's out. two two something. days. Something I need out. to get on that then, dude. I have not read any era two. I just recently reread, you the know, the original one, yeah. Mistborn series. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's something else, man. I'm just always shocked by how awesome that is. Yeah, yeah. I think um, either next week or the week after was gonna be our uh, the lost metal episode. So yeah, we're we're definitely. I definitely nice. need a reread of. Uh, of era too otherwise i'm gonna have no idea what was going on and (laughs) what's funny is murphy napier did a was it it was either it was either murphy or elliot brooks did a a video recapping all of era two as we go into the lost metal for people who need it and i was watching the video i'm like oh this is all i need i just need like a quick recap and then even during the recap i was like I don't, I don't, I don't remember <laughs> any of this. I'm like, I, I need. You know, to I felt the exact same way. Go back and do it all. My wife actually made the like the very similar video. Oh really? With like she like did like a collab with somebody else, and I watched the video just a couple of days ago, and I was like, "There's still a lot I'm missing yeah. right now." Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. There, there's, there's some fantastic characters in Era Two. Like I. I, just real quick, I love the big flip flop I made on uh, Steris. Like at, yeah. fir- at at first, I hated her, and then by the end of the third book, she's like one of my favorite characters. I think that's so cool that he was able to pull that off. And it's so cool because he doesn't like change her, right? He, and yet, and yet, you still like your opinion of her changes, and I think that's that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. 
so I, I want to talk about the the Threadlight trilogy. You know, I, I think that one of the things that self-published works sometimes get criticized for is, um, you, you know, there, there's a lot of good authors out there that put the money into like good covers and good audiobook narrators and stuff. But then there's like, a percentage of just like it just doesn't have a lot of polish it's not that it's bad work or anything it's just it just doesn't have sometimes like, it's bad yeah sometimes <laughs> yeah. it's bad i'm trying to be nice um but yeah like there there's certain books that just don't don't have the polish that that other ones do and one thing that really impressed me about about threadlight not only like the story and the characters and everything but just the overall polish for this series, everything from uh, your covers to your audiobook na narrator to um, the story, like it's such a, it's such a good, like concise story. The barrier for entry is, is very low in that I feel like I could hand voice of war to pretty much anybody yeah. and be like, here's your gateway to fantasy and then as they go along the trilogy, I, I feel like the trilogy kind of like grows with the reader at a very, you know, reasonable pace. And by the time you get to the third book, it's it's more complex than the first one. But by the time you get there, you've you've learned along the way and you've grown as a reader. And so I I really, really love the polish for these books. And God, those hard I forgot I was gonna get a picture for it. The hardcovers are so yeah. gorgeous. They're so beautiful. I, I I need to get them so I can have them on my shelf. Um, but so with all that being said, like, you know, you you had your uh, Barnes and Noble signing and and you got it on the shelves there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a bunch there. I also I sell them from my website if yeah. you're in the U.S. Yeah, and and I guess what I'm saying is like, you know, with all that polish, like I, I feel like these books like I could so easily see on the shelves of like big you know bookstores and stuff have you thought about you know with with as much success as you've had with Voice of War and and the sequels have you thought about going trad pub at all or do you kind of want to stay in the in the self pub because every now and then I'll read a self pub book and I'm like this is like and and some people want to stay in self pub they don't want to do trad pub for certain reasons and that's totally valid but sometimes i read a uh, a series and i'm like this could easily be trad pub it's a it's a big big question it's a hefty one there yeah. <laughs> um, and you know i i go back and forth on this a lot yeah. i have you know a lot of indie author friends who are much more successful than me i mean there's indie authors who are making you know 200 300,000 dollars a year yeah, writing geez. books and <laughs> There are a, traditional published authors are not making that. Yeah, <laughs> we'll say. And I have traditionally published author friends who like they're they like they you know work for like tour and like they can't even they won't even give them an audiobook, you know, oh, like really? random stuff and like you know they're beyond the initial you know maybe five or ten thousand uh, dollar initial payment that they got from the publisher like have made zero dollars. Yeah, Ooh. and it takes them you know three or four years to get that book out. Jeez. And so it's, it's hard because there's also like the other side where like, would I like to see my books in all of the bookstores? Yeah. yeah that would be so cool if I just <laughs> yeah. like, you know, went to some random state or maybe yeah. like, you know, I'm over, go over to like London and like my books in the bookstore, yeah. like that would be so yep. cool. Yeah. And that's like <laughs> the one thing that indie authors don't get. Um, our books are just, are way more expensive. Yeah. Uh, like, so to get it in Barnes and Noble, for example, you have to one have it available through uh, a an approved uh, published like publisher yeah and so ingram spark is usually the one that people use indie authors and you have to have a 50 percent markup or so they have to have a 50 percent discount on purchasing the book and there has to be refunds enabled for it oh i, I was gonna so say if they don't sell it they they can send it back and then i have you, to pay for you it. lose yeah. the money yeah yeah i was i was gonna say i'm really surprised people still use ingram spark because i've heard that they just fuck you like <laughs> well i mean it's there's not really great options yeah right? right like that's as far as options go like that one at least for hardcovers in particular 
Hmm. It's the best option for hardcovers. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Amazon is better for paperbacks. Like it's just it'll be cheaper just in general. Yeah. Um, but then again, like you can't get it into bookstores if it's just on Amazon. Right. So. What What does Broken Binding do? Are they just a bookseller, or do they also print? So they're kind of switching it up. Yeah. yeah. So they are just a bookseller. Uh, they love working with indie authors, right? Like Ryan Cahill's like their like best friend right now. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And He's their golden boy. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're honestly they are awesome. Like yeah, they're yeah. great to work with. I even put together like a a Google Doc of how to work with Broken Binding that oh, I shared cool. with a bunch of other indie authors. Cool. Whoa, cool. Because they're like, oh, Broken Binding reached out to me, and I don't know what they're talking. They're like, talk, asking me for like a tip in. I'm like, what is that? I'm yeah. Like, okay. Here's my Google. Here you doc. go. All the information. Oh, cool. It's got like nice. like Photoshop files that you can use as like your like templates and stuff. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, but they they said, hey, you know, we keep doing all of these like special editions through publishers. Why don't we do that for indie authors? Like, there's indie authors who sell way more books than a lot of these traditionally published yeah. authors, and people want special editions that aren't crazy priced. Right. And so, I mean, that's obviously true when you look at Kickstarter, right? Like yeah. there's yeah. so many like incredibly successful Kickstarters even going on right now, like Sword of Kaigen's at like $200,000 or something right now. Wow. And uh, Ben Galley has been crushing it with all of his. He's at like $50,000 or something for his book two in his series that he published 10 years ago. Is is Sword of Kaigen getting a special edition through Kickstarter? Is that what that is? Yeah, yeah. There nice. is. Uh, doing a special edition through Wraithmark Creative, nice. who does a lot of progression fantasy, actually, too. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, so Broken Binding said, hey, we're going to, like, we want to start doing that for indie authors. And so they announced their first one, which was for Ryan Cahill's uh, Of Blood and Fire. Uh, it's got, yes, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, just just go look it up, like the special yeah. edition of it. It's just absolutely beautiful. That's cool. That was a random, random, I can't remember how we got there. That's I okay. know, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm it like, all works out. I'm actively trying to remember where we yeah, spun off. It all from. works out in the end. <laughs> oh, Trad Pub versus Indie Pub. That yes. Was, yeah, that's yeah, what it yeah, was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I keep going back and forth. I I think for my the next series that I'm gonna write, I am going to query the first book and see if I can find an agent. Okay. Um, whether or not I sell it to a publisher is, you know, a, a question on top of that. Yeah. But agents can also get you like foreign rights deals if I want to get like translations for books and things like that. And so that would also be pretty cool. What nice. does what does query mean? Is, is that like you finish it, set it aside until this thing happens? You're sending yes. it out to, to publishers. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, you send like a you just send an email. It's usually, you know, not too long, but it basically is like pitching yourself. You know, like, okay, hey, here cool. Here's who I am. Here's this. This is what book, I do. Yeah. And here's why you should read it. Blah blah blah. Nice. Did, did I see a, did, did you write a short story recently? Was that you? I, I thought I saw a cover somewhere. Yeah, yeah. What Five Silver Rings. Yes. What What is that? Yeah, this was, I just kind of wanted to try something new after I finished Bonds of Chaos. Mm -hmm. And short stories are nice because then I don't have to like be committed to a full story. Yep. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so this is, it's about this woman and her husband who, I mean, it starts off basically like this Lovecraftian monster oh. consumes her husband and she finds uh, a silver ring in his ashes. And then she discovers that these silver rings, uh, when she places them in this magical sphere inside their forge, uh, sends her into memories. And oh. so she starts learning kind of what happened. Oh, very cool. Sounds cool. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of fun. So one thing I wanted to ask about real quick is you, because uh, I, I don't think I ever got to uh, catch up with you about this. You mentioned doing like this this Google Doc for self-published authors, and I, I see you kind of working like this in the self-published community a lot. Uh, you you made a, it wasn't a Kickstarter, was it? It was like some sort of donation for Indie Pub. Yeah, the for... Indie Fantasy Fund. Yes. Can you tell me about that? And how did that go? I don't think I ever stayed up to date on that. Yeah, that was uh, an idea that Hillary and I had. Uh, we, I just frankly, like we were very blessed. <laughs> uh, my day job is very good. And I like spend all of this time around a lot of indie authors, like you mentioned, right, that have like, you know, poor covers or it's not mm -hmm. edited or they can't afford to do an audiobook. 
And some of them, like I've read their books and they're amazing. Like Sarah yeah. Chorn is an amazing writer. She's never had an audiobook for any of her books. And I was like, people like that, like, I wish I could do something for them. And so we had this idea. We're like, hey, let's create this grant program where a certain amount of money is set aside. We receive applications. People send in, you know, information about like what they would use the money for, uh, books that they've, you know, published previously, and then a 10 page excerpt of uh, the book that they would like the grant for. Okay. And then we went through and we kind of said like, hey, uh, don't really want to support somebody doing this. <laughs> we don't want to support somebody. Oh, yes, we do want to support somebody doing yeah. this. This sounds great. And then we go through and read all of the applications. We had like 150 applications. Wow. It was a lot more than wow. we expected yeah. in the first round. <laughs> um, but then we, yeah, we were like, hey, we're going to choose five authors and we're going to give them $1,000 each. Wow. And we are not going to follow up about what the money is used for. We yeah. hope that they will use it for, you know, sure. what they said they were going to yeah. use it for. Right. But really it's like, we just want to you know, try to help indie authors get the, you know, that level of polish that you mentioned yeah. uh, in a way that they previously couldn't. So we ended up and choosing so, six okay. <laughs> instead of five because there was a lot of good ones. And so That's just awesome. for me to clarify this, this was out of your own pocket. You're providing this money. Type thing. It was, yeah, it's, it's kind of like where, you know, the money I make from selling books, yep. we don't, we don't really need. Yeah. And so we're so like, let's, let's try to, to like reinvest this into other people. Man, yeah. I really, I really admire that a lot, yeah. Zach. I think that that's, that's a very really awesome. important piece of what you guys do. And I've heard this from other authors too. And it just really is a cool community with people willing to do stuff like that to help out somebody else that doesn't necessarily have gotten as far as you or are trying to so yeah my hat's off to you yeah that's fantastic um it is a great community yes yeah, it's so awesome gabe do you want to take the uh the next one about narrators and all that okay like we mentioned the cover art is incredible and your narrator is pure gold pun intended but <laughs> yep i think we've talked about some of this before but do you want to talk about how you met your wonderful artists and what it's been like working with them, cover art, narrators, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I love talking about this because I think this is probably one of the reasons I would want to stay indie published. Yeah. Cause I just love this part. Yeah. Um, I just, I go and I do a ton of research. And so like for artists, I go on art station and I'll just like, you know, search for something and I look at it, like all of the different art. I'm like, Oh, this one's cool. This one's cool. I go look to see if like their other artwork is cool. And then I'll also like, if I find somebody that I really like, I'll look at who they're following and oh. see like the artwork for those people. So it's kind of like oh. this, like, you know, yeah. Nice. Hole. yeah. yeah. Uh, also there's a bunch of artists on Twitter and Instagram. So you can kind of search there too. I actually just found somebody on Twitter a couple of days ago who I reached out to. I have a really cool map for my new series. Okay. And I, I reached out to them to create like this, uh, like extra cool border around the outside of the map. Yeah. And so I, yeah, just, just heard back from one of the two people actually I reached out to and it's this random person living in Turkey. <laughs> and she was like, oh, for something complicated like that, I think I'd probably charge like, you know, a hundred dollars. Well, <laughs> and I was like, so that's like kind of like the interesting thing too. Yeah. Like, as I, as I go through, I have like a, a spreadsheet of all <laughs> of these course. different illustrators and, yeah. you know, links to their stuff and then like how much they charge. The, the range is insane. Yeah, yeah. Like I they're like I was looking at like the the Justice of Kings uh, by Richard Swan. Yeah, really cool cover. And I was like, oh, I wonder about that. Like you know, cover illustrator, five thousand uh, dollars for the oh. cover art. And I'm like, that's a lot yeah. for an indie oh, author. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. was the most I've heard so far. Actually, is, is he indie? Richard he is not Swan? indie. No, oh, no, no. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. So I think it's I think he's Orbit maybe. So okay. they they forked out the money for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, so there's, wild. you know, high end, you know, up there in the 5,000, I think yeah. the average range is probably between one and $2,000 for a cover. Yeah. Uh, the guy that I found for voice of war, uh, when I reached out to him, just a guy I found on art station and I was like, Hey, I'm like, you know, interested in commissioning you. And he's like, Oh, I've never done a commission. Uh, but yeah, I maybe like, cause I was like, I'm interested in doing like for the entire trilogy. Right. Yeah. And he was like, uh, I don't know, maybe like $240 for the trilogy. Like, so like 80 bucks a a cover. Wow. 
And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, let's do all three of them right now, man. Yeah, let's get it done. <laughs> and then I actually, I after afterwards, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm actually going to pay you more than that. Yeah, yeah. like you and, deserve more. And, and I'm going to tell you that you need to raise your price. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. then I sent him a bunch of uh, indie authors because like even yeah. still, like right now, I think he charges like 400, which like compared yeah. to a lot of yeah. illustrators is still not very much. Yeah. But right. he's just like living over in Turkey and like that's incredible money for him. And he's yeah. super sure. happy doing it. So actually, like we break immortals, he did that cover. Was that him? I was wondering. It's the same same guy as my covers. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I was I I had a feeling it was the same guy, but I wasn't sure. That's awesome. Yeah, he did that one. He actually did Pantheon Den of Thieves, the one I was just talking about. Okay. Uh, nice. The lit RPG. He did Paladin Unbound. Oh, he's, cool. He's been kind of kind of getting around. Awesome. Yeah. yeah awesome that's awesome so does his other um like his art that you saw on art station does it look like this or it, is this like a different style than he usually does or mine is a a little more character focused than his his are like the classic you know small figure giant monster which right. is kind of like if you look at bonds of chaos like yeah you know small yeah creature and like giant <laughs> spiked gorilla in the <laughs> yep. back that's like more like his his classic style yeah but yeah Okay, cool. Sweet. Yeah, I I love the I love the swamp gorilla in Bonds of Chaos. I was like, I was like, oh, he he wanted his uh his shadow of the gods. <laughs> I Thanks, love Drake. That. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love that. It's such an awesome cover. All right, so let's see. What do I have next? Oh, we didn't talk about the narrator. Oh, uh, Adam Gold. Yeah, how'd you meet Adam, Adam Gold? Gold? Yeah, so there's so ACX is Audible's uh, publishing arm. Uh huh. And any authors can go on there. They can create auditions and have people just like random narrators, you know, yeah. read a sample and things like that. I didn't do that. I went through and I like filtered down like the kinds of voices I like. Then I just listened to probably my wife makes fun of me because I probably listened to like 300 narrators. Oh. And I just like for days was just like listening to like samples and Adam Gold, I found the first day and throughout the rest of like you know the 300 i listened to i was just like this guy is just like his range is really cool yeah and so i reached out to him and yeah we we did uh we did it through acx for voice of war and then for the second the second and third book we did it through dropbox oh, okay <laughs> nice yeah. so there was nice. like no you know no like kind no of separation there yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah he's he's awesome he actually mostly does uh romance books Oh, oh really women women love he has a like good yeah, yeah. Bass, yes you know. he's got a sense. good his voice voice. Is sexy, let's be honest <laughs> yes oh, it yeah. is <laughs> absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah he ha he has a great voice for for audiobooks and like you said his range is so like um like the voice for uh iliana and like willow and stuff is so good like i would have never yeah. you know some some guys try to do you know female voices and yeah. it's all right but it's you know it's it's just like a really high octave or something and adam gold really sells it man yeah he, he really really does a good job with that and he's got really good subtlety to his different accents which i really like yeah and the apogee yes oh dude and, so and that, even, was, that was part of the reason why I yeah because i yeah. i had that voice in my head yeah and so i like that was one of the very first things we talked about. I was like, "Hey, man, like this is what I want here," and he was like, "Okay, <laughs> yeah, I got that." And even Su Chan for 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 the gorilla too. It does a really yeah. good job. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I, I guess like the the big question that we all probably want to get to. Oh yeah, Gabe's got it right there. Were you, were you wanting to ask that one? Yeah, yeah, I'll I, ask I, it. I so, it. okay. okay. Uh, what would you say are the most important things for a new self published author to focus on when creating or marketing their debut? novel book whatever uh what's the biggest thing you've learned while doing this who i know uh, it's another big one and you probably get asked that a lot i would think yeah i you know i think my my first advice is ryan cahill wrote a really good blog post for self-published fantasy month oh I cool think in maybe 2020 okay. maybe it was 2021 i can't remember but if you look up ryan cahill you know self publish fantasy month is that what i said, was that what I said yeah. it was? uh but he like talks about like all of these like tips for for like first time publishing okay. and it's really really good um i will say there are things not to focus on um don't focus on like social media like it is Ooh, it's not going to yeah. sell your books and i think that's oh really something that a lot of 
you know, indie authors kind of get caught up on. They're like, okay, well, I have to be really, you know, focused on this. Like there are a lot there. I'd say like the indie authors making the most money are not making it from any kind of um, social media presence. Really? Because um, like Amazon, that's where all the, that's where all your sales come from as an indie author. And like, there's no real connection between, you know, posting Twitter on and Amazon, Twitter and yeah. getting people to actually buy the book. Okay. Um, it's ads and then, you know, having a good cover, having a good blurb and then having a good first chapter. Yeah. So, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I, I made a video a while back and I, and voice of war was, was in it as a example for a good cover, but I was like, man, a, a cover, you know, th there's the old adage of like, don't judge a book by its cover, but yeah. nobody fucking does that. Like, nobody, <laughs> nobody does you know, that. And I, I actually think yeah. it's important for indie authors too. Like yeah. when I, when I'm looking at indie books, the quality of the cover tells, tells me you. that, tells me that this person is serious about it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And for a traditionally published author, like I already know, like they've got like people working on this, like it could be a right. garbage cover. And I know like at least the insides is still going to be yep. like, you know, well yeah. taken care of. Right. But for an indie author, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think like, you know, like, like you said, if you're, if you're willing to put in like the time and effort and money into your, into your cover, like that means that this is a real investment for you. And, you know, more often than not, you've probably invested a lot into what's in between as well. So, so a question that I, I forgot to ask is, where did the the inspiration from the for the story kind of come from? And and you talked about, you know, we talked about like the Mistborn inspiration. We talked about like the kid and whatnot, uh, the the chosen one being, you know, protected by the parents and all that. But where where did like the bulk of the the very first idea to like write this story? Like when was it where you're like, I I I have this story. I want to tell it. I'm gonna start putting it down on paper. So it's, it's actually funny because I had been thinking about this for years okay. and Hillary, like Hillary and I both like chatted about stories for a long time. And it was actually not until I became a dungeon master. Oh, oh nice. We, we had this, we had this D and D group and we were playing this campaign, uh, storm Kings thunder. And I had had everybody give me backstories like when we first started. And as we went, I started like weaving their backstories into like the, the, overarching storyline and then i created like this separate storyline on top of like the storm king thunder storyline that tied into all their stuff and there was there was this i mean first of all there was like some really good moments with like all of the characters but there was this one moment where this was when we were living in california and everybody was there in person with us and uh, we had this moment where they like killed this like big baddie and they had been like plagued by the zentarm faction for like since the very first um session that we had and this is probably like, I don't know, six months in. And they kill this big baddie and this little minion comes forward and kneels in front of one of the other characters in the in the party <laughs> and bows down and says, first Lord. And then oh. I ended the session and I was like, and that's where we're going to end. And everyone looked at the person and was like, <laughs> what? Yeah. And it was just like audible gasps. They were like, what is happening? And even the person that the person kneeled in front of was yeah. like, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But they had like left gaps in their backstory, and so I like I filled it in. Okay. And it was like that moment where I was like, I could I could do this. Yeah. I can take like this complex nice. story, like you know, weave these other storylines into it, uh, kind of like focused on like the characters, and I was like, and people like it, and That's it worked. Awesome. And so that was the moment where I was like, dude, I could I could write a book. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's a little bit silly because it like came from no. you know, being a DM in Dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons, but it was that was the moment that like really kicked it into gear. Where I was like, I should, I should tell the story. I can do it. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. I my um one of my girlfriend's coworkers came over for a Halloween party. You know, it was the day before Halloween or whatever, and she plays D and D with her friends, family, all that stuff. And so she was talking to me about it. And I was like, man, dude, this is something that I would thoroughly enjoy playing. I've never had a chance, never really seen it, but we got our first session in a week. I'm going to go oh, play some D&D. Cool. So yes. yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really Love excited. I... Do you have your character all ready to go? So I'm starting. I'm starting. 
but I had, I don't have a whole lot. Um, she gave me this like kind of outline to like, think about the way to set it up and stuff. So I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out next time we, in a week, I'll talk about it and let you guys you know. You're going to be a dungeon crawler named Carl. Yeah. Carl. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How'd you know? <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm excited that's, though. That's funny. I I've never played dungeons and dragons, but I tried playing uh pathfinder with, it was, that was really popular a few years ago. And I I think that I just I can't like role play like I'm not good at like doing like that aspect of it and everybody at the table was like talking in their characters voices yeah, and like that's it. like they they knew exactly like what their character was and like they would respond as if they were their character and I was just like okay like I I was the I, I did not do well in drama class in, in <laughs> yeah. high school. Like I, I can't, I like, I just couldn't like take it seriously. And I'm glad that people can, I'm glad that people like enjoy it. I, I don't think, you know, it, it's, it's a good, it's a fun game and I'm glad people have fun with it. But for me, so I'm you're just saying like, is Zach, you're a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just like, I, I don't know. For some reason I can't commit to like the role play. I don't know what it is. All right, so I guess uh, I guess the the last one of the last questions that kind of goes along with that is, did you have this story kind of all mapped out from the beginning? Did you have like an outline? Because there's definitely foreshadowing in the first book that that you know we find out in the third. Um, but ha like, how much did you have uh, mapped out and outlined and all that? I would say I probably had like seventy five percent of it outlined ahead of time. Nice. Okay. Uh, I am definitely a planner. Okay. Uh, there's there are authors who like Mark Lawrence. He just has like a character and then he just starts writing. Yeah. And I'm like that would that would literally like hurt my soul to do. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would just I would just stare at the screen and be like I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I usually have like chapter outlines before I start writing. Okay. Like, I I need to know like where I'm going and what I'm doing. And yeah. I get to fill it in. Try to try to make it you know pretty. But, yeah, I'd I'd yeah. be so afraid that I would like get to the end and want to tie it back to the beginning in some way, but I'm at such a completely different area yeah. at the end where you you can't tie it in. I I feel like I would worry about that. I I definitely think that I would be a a pretty heavy outliner as well. All right, Gabe, now's your chance. Last one. okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, Zach, what is next for you? Any thoughts about your next book or series? Will you ever return to the Threadlight series? Um, and Or was that ending pretty final? Well, it was pretty final. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that I will likely come back for either some short stories or maybe a novella. Okay. Or cool. Like a prequel kind of thing. I don't think I'll do anything like after Crazy. Bonds of Chaos. After yeah. the events, yeah. Um, but I, I do have something I'm working on. I'm working on the new series. I'm stoked about it. I, I mentioned I have a, a map, an initial map made for it. Yeah. The map is awesome. <laughs> I can get a cool border for it. Oh my gosh, dude, this thing is going to be epic. <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> um, but it the the new series is called, and I can I can talk about it because I've been like releasing like I was just going to ask you to my yeah, newsletter. The is, yeah. Uh, so the series is called Symphony in the Skies. Okay. And the first book is called The Fall of Cloud Seven. Ooh. So essentially what the series is about is a world where 500 years ago, uh, monsters crawled out of the ground and started basically like slaughtering everybody. And so the magic wield wielders of the world uh, lifted seven islands out of the ground. So just oh. like basically just like yeah. sections of the earth, just yep. shoved it up into the sky. Uh, and those are called clouds. And so there are seven, seven havens where all of mankind currently lives. And the Teroth, these monsters, still uh, haunt the the ground. And so there's uh, that's kind of like the world. Uh, the magic is is based on music. Oh, oh cool! Okay. And so that that's why it's symphony in the sky. Yeah, it's, it's all yeah. coming together. Um, but what I wanted to do differently with this one, uh, one of the things that people really liked about Threadlight that I didn't really I don't know expect at the beginning was they liked seeing like families and married people yeah uh -huh. and, and married people that were like that like each other yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were like chris and ariel are nice like they yeah. actually like, try to support each other exactly so, yeah. the uh this will be like the similar vein where there's going to be three points of view 
Okay. And all three of them are going to be married people. Oh, cool. So there's going to be a, a 60 year old retired warrior and his warrior wife. There's going to be a 40 year old musician and her husband. And then there's going to be a 20 year old uh, tone reader, which is kind of like a palm reader in this world. Okay. Uh, and her wife. Nice. Cool. That's awesome. And so is there, I don't even know if I can ask this. You can let it out. Is there a time frame? Like, are we like a year out more? Do you know? I, I want to have, I want to have a solid version of it done next yeah. year. Okay, cool. And so I'm, I think I'm only like four or five chapters in right now, but I've got like, I've got the good base. The, the yep. initial chapters are always really hard for me. Yes. Especially like with multiple points of view. Cause I'm like, okay, I got to get this character and like, you know, yeah. who are they and like, how's it going to work? Right. Um, but it's, it's starting to come along nicely now. I am hoping to get a huge chunk of it done this month actually. Nice. But I don't, I don't think we'll have, you know, anything worth sharing until for, uh, yeah, you know, at least mid next year. Cool. And then I got to decide, am I going to, you know, traditionally publish this thing? Cause then I got to start querying it. Yeah. Right? And so then you wouldn't see it for even longer after that. Yep. Yeah. If I self published, I could do it. I could turn it around pretty quickly. <laughs> well, I'll listen to it when it comes Seriously. out. That sounds awesome, dude. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. I loved, uh, that, that was one thing that I definitely really loved about Threadlight was, was Chris and his wife, because I I've said a few times on the podcast that I feel like in, the majority of fantasy series you have like your your young hero and he kind of meets somebody in the second book or whatever and then by the end of the third book like in the epilogue basically or at the climax of the story they're just starting to like get together and they kind of finish the last few chapters like as a couple or whatever and i feel like there's not too many books where you have like the power couple all the way through it's it's really yeah. rare um, and I think the first time where I really found a book, uh, that had that was, uh, Vin and Ellen in, in Mistborn. Yes. And I, I think that was the episode I, I first brought it up in where I was like, man, it was nice to see like these people get together in the first book. And then the second and third, like they are like basically they're still together. Married. Yeah. Yeah. They're and, still together. And they're there all the way through. And so I, I, I really enjoyed that in the stories. Um, they're there until the end. And exactly until the... exactly quite uh, literally yeah <laughs> um but so you mentioned there's seven clouds uh you you realize you've missed a huge opportunity to have cloud nine <laughs> <laughs> no i i considered it originally yeah and i was like no i can't do that that's like, no oh, that's too, too much. much it's too much <laughs> cloud nine is just like the perfect island where everybody... <laughs> yeah where all oh, the nobles say, live and stuff. The, one of the things I'm really excited about is the retired warrior couple. Their storyline is based on John Wick. Oh, what? what? How? So I'm, I'm, <laughs> except for instead of dog, they, they raise sky whales. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. I'm, I'm pretty, yeah. They're, Dude, that's already, awesome. They're, what I've written of theirs already, I'm like super it's there. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. so cool. All right, well, let's uh, let's go into our spoiler discussion. We'll try not to keep you up too late here, Zach. Um, so, listeners, spoiler warning. If you have not read the Threadlight trilogy, go watch my review. <laughs> and, yeah. Then, and, 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 yeah. Yeah. and then read the books and then come back and, uh, and you'll probably enjoy this discussion a lot more. Um, so, spoiler warning in three, two... One, you've been warned. Um, all right, so I ask this every time we have a uh, we have an author on to talk about their talk about their book in a spoilery fashion, and our listeners are probably getting tired of me using the same question, but I feel like it's important. Um, so a lot of when authors come on here, they often say like, I haven't had much of a chance to talk spoilers about my book usually it's like a spoiler free interview or whatever um so is have has there been any like spoilery things that you've been itching to talk about since releasing bonds of chaos you know i was i was nervous about releasing bonds of chaos really because of because of time travel and genocide <laughs> oh. i was like i don't know how these are gonna go yeah <laughs> but i 
I felt like I had given enough hints that like when the time travel happened, it wouldn't be like too crazy. Yeah. Between yeah. like, you know, they get the pocket watch in the very first one and they kind of hold that out. And it's kind of a thing throughout. Yeah. I mean, yeah. wait, yeah, explain, so, explain the pocket watch. Yeah. So that was, that was part of the uh, reason why the pocket watch appeared in the first book. Cause I wanted like the concept of time to be kind of just like injected into your head. Yeah. Right. And then it gets like lost and it becomes like a thing in book two and book two. They're like, you know, as yeah. long as, as long as I it keeps remember. ticking, as long as it keeps ticking, you know, we'll, we're we'll good. have hope. Um, wait, so wait, yeah. remind me in the first book, it isn't the pocket watch something he always has, or is it? Something no. So, he gets after so the, the great Lord or whatever his name is, gives it to Chris when his baby's oh, like being born, right. it was a yeah. gift. Okay. And so, yeah. It was it was a moment. You know, yes. Oh, got this super expensive gift. Cool. Yeah. yeah. What do we do it's with like, it? <laughs> there's only a couple that have been made. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, I loved I loved the time travel section because like, I I feel like like at first you're kind of watch you're kind of reading listening to the time travel section and you're not sure if it's real or like what exactly is going on. But then Alcaeus goes back to, yeah. you know, where where chapter one. Yeah, chapter yep. one. Basically, the the kids, you know, in in fear of dying, and Alcaeus is like, "I'm the only one who can save you." And once that happened, it clicked for me, like, "Oh, they're time traveling," and yeah. it was just this really cool, like, I guess, just like reveal moment for me, where I was like, "Man, this," because I I had kind of like. Honestly, I had kind of forgot about like the odd old man who showed up in in chapter one. Like so many other things had happened that I kind yeah. of forgot that there was like this weird old guy that that <laughs> saved that saved Aiden's life. Um, and then for that to be Alcaeus, that was like, yeah. And then I agree. And then to find out that it was um, that it was both Alvarax and Laurel who made Alabella and Jellium amber thread weaver yes um man that that is so cool and, and another thing that works really well with that scene is you first see if i remember remembering correctly you first see um alabella and jellium get their shards but you don't understand i i think the average well, the, like i at the time i didn't understand that that was giving them amber thread light yeah but yeah. But then you get the scene with Alcaeus okay. and, and yep. he puts the shard into the kid and your brain like puts two and two together, right? Like, yeah. oh, he's an Amber yeah. Threadweaver. What's going on? And so, dude, I just love, like that clicks together in so many ways. Like that's such a fantastic scene. I yeah. Was, I was worried writing that scene, but I'm, I'm glad it worked for you guys. No, <laughs> yeah, it's, it was awesome. And just like Spencer said, I wasn't sure at first. And then, and then I remember I was, you know, I deliver for Amazon. I was driving my van, delivering packages. And I listened to that and I had to stop for a second and like try and comprehend what I thought was going on. Right. And then it clicked with, uh, you know, with the ending of that scene or whatever. Yeah. I was like, that's so cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I, I, I do have a question though. And I, I wish, uh -oh. I, I wish I'd pulled that. <laughs> not, not a bad question. I'm just wondering, I, I think I'm still, you, you tweeted me a, a timeline of, of what was happening <laughs> and i just need clarification so so the timeline is alcaeus goes and puts the shard in aiden but then the next scene is chris and he's he's going through the convergence and he ends up with some alcaeus what what timeline is that Alcaeus in that they're meet? Like, does that make sense? I'm not. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. It's so I, I actually wanted it to be confusing. Okay. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I wanted chaos in the name of the book. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I was like, the book gets a little chaotic, and I like, I want, I want it to feel intentional. Um, but basically, Alca what happens is, oh yeah. Sorry, I was just gonna say, because in that scene, Alcaeus is confused. He's like, "What are you doing here? Where's your thread light?" And yeah. so I wasn't sure, like is this the Alcaeus before everybody gets there? Like had Chris gone there, showed up and disappeared, then everybody showed up and Alcaeus is like, what the fuck is going on? That is exactly <laughs> correct. Yep. <Okay>. Nice, nice. <laughs> okay, so so when he says, I just had the weirdest experience, when Alcaeus says that, is that 
the experience he just had from dipping himself in the in the pool because at the end of at the end of stones of light he goes into the pool right so he in the end of stones of light he's playing with the string right like so that's like the the time travel hint right there right okay it's like you know you can you can bend space why not bend time yeah and so actually his experience was it, it's not explained in the book, by the way. So like, oh, okay. it's just kind okay. of like left kind of open. Gotcha. Maybe you can, maybe oh, you can okay. assume. Okay. But Alkea is named after Alcaeus because of this experience that he just had. He just, he time traveled for the first time and he went back in time into pre alkea and these people met him and they were like, oh my gosh, you're a God. <laughs> and so he like, you know, he was he like imparted some wisdom to them. Yeah. Including oh. saying like, you know, it's probably good for people only to have two kids instead of three oh. because of his family experience. Yeah. And oh, and he's okay. like, you know, it's better to see truth and light. Some of these little quips that he's said before. So cool. Oh, okay. So, that's awesome. So, so this was a time travel experience he had before everybody showed up. Yep. And yeah. then Chris so shows up he's and he's like, twice. and then he's like, wait, what's going on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then Chris disappears and Chris comes back and he's like, really what's going on I'm why are, yeah, yeah where you are my old friend or whatever and then said. he dies uh, yep. yeah. yeah uh yeah so i'm sorry but the the last time i <laughs> this last time i went through bonds of chaos i was kind of like running through it to read it before this podcast what exactly did alcaeus die from was it just like the stress of traveling through time and stuff yep yeah okay. it uh yeah it uses essentially like uh, the elixir is what is holding him together yeah right, right? like he he lives He's on elixir. so old yeah and yeah the the convergence is taking that from him gotcha okay. gotcha what is uh what's been your most favorite part of the trilogy that you've written that you've put there's a there? big question for you <laughs> yeah. my favorite part um <laughs> shoot there's i mean there's parts in every book that i think i really enjoyed writing yeah this the scene in book one where chris misses his kid's birth yes. he's outside the house fighting fighting all these uh, blood that, like, thieves yeah. as a dad that scene like hurt oh, me i was like yeah. i hate this so much like that would be <laughs> that would just literally be the worst that was and a so great that was scene. it was fun to write because it, it felt like in, like personally impactful yeah yeah um book two i mean i really like writing like the endings of all the books mm-hmm. yeah. where everything just like starts you know getting chaotic and, and coming together yeah i really like those like high intensity moments um book two Alvarax and Jacena, like every one of their yes. like, moments yeah. together, I just really, really enjoyed writing. Yeah. Uh, I still have people mad at me for killing her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that was that was a brutal scene where Yeah, like, that was really I, tough. I did not I did not see that coming where um Relic is like, oh, she's the mistress of mercy. We can't have any mercy, and just kills her right there. And Alvarax is like, wait, what the fuck? Like <laughs> Oh, actually yeah, whenever i sign stones of light the, like <laughs> the phrase that i write is there can be no mercy because i'm like i was just gonna, oh, I'm gonna write yeah. it here and then as you read you're gonna see that relic says it multiple times throughout the yep. book and so it's like boom oh no yeah <laughs> man that's yeah fantastic. uh and then yeah, i really like that uh oh in book two also the scene where willow saves chris in the swamp. oh yes. yes that's one of mine yes yep. that's a great that one. was I mean, I just first of all, I just love that moment. I think it's yeah. great. And there's part part of what I love about it is I'm part of a writing group, uh-huh. and uh, we like so they like you know had seen a bunch of these scenes leading up to it. I shared that scene with them, and one of the guys is like, he's a police officer. He's kind of like a macho guy. Yeah. And he was like, "Are you kidding me? His mom <laughs> saves him. <laughs> what a joke." And I was like, oh, and I was like, bro, I'm not changing it. I love it. Yep, <laughs> that's it, dude. That's it. No, and I'll say like so many people love that scene and I'm like, okay. Yeah. You yeah, made the right decision. Sometimes you, right. Know, you take you take feedback and sometimes you you don't. So yeah. for sure. Yeah. I mean, you don't yeah, you don't always it doesn't always need to be like the big hero like saving the day. Like I love that scene. Like yeah, it was no, so, that was awesome. It was so heartwarming. Oh, also Alvarex's just... grandfather. I really like him. Oh yes, yeah, me is, too. He doesn't have a name. I never oh, gave him a name. Yeah, that's a good point. We've never heard a name. <laughs> and people are like, wait, what? Really? I'm like, I wanted to see if I could create a character that people really, you know, cared about and didn't have a name. name. Wow. That's impressive. Grandpa. That's yeah. nuts. 
Yeah. Yeah, dude, just his uncaring or undying love for Alvarax is always just awesome. In the second book, and especially the third, when he goes back to meet him, I was like, that's really impressive. Yeah. Just like, it's love with no bounds. I So I, I love this subversion of of Aiden and and you talked about it in the in the spoiler free section where you wanted to have the chosen one but you got to keep him alive and then it turns out like he's like you completely subvert it and it's so it's so awesome like that last line in in bonds of chaos like you know they were never the chosen ones like our our children were I just I love I don't know I love that idea because like the whole time it's so alluded to Aiden being the person that's going to say, key. yeah, yeah. He's the key to everything. <clears throat> and even, even Alcaeus, when he goes back in time, you know, he, he puts the shard in, in Aiden and he tells Chris, like your, your kid is going to be the key to everything. And you tell me if I'm wrong, but my guess is that he was, he was saying that because he already he knew that he already said that so he must need to say it to and he to, believed to, it yeah to keep the timeline yeah, yeah exactly yeah yeah i think i think that's absolutely <laughs> that, la that last line though there have been i think maybe two or three people who have reached out to me and they're like are you implying that willow and rosha went back in time and that chris and alvarax are actually their kids <laughs> oh no i didn't get that i was like oh, that's not what that was supposed to be <laughs> like, no that wasn't it nice try though uh, time travels funny. it's it's gone <laughs> uh, speaking of speaking of willow and and roshar i i thought it was like everybody's everybody's getting together in this book everybody's everybody's <laughs> fucking in this book oh i thought God, <laughs> i thought I thought for sure Alvarax and Laurel were gonna were gonna get together, and then you then you kill Laurel, and I'm like, God, Zach. Dude, Dude, she died for it? the most noble cause, though. I guess. Well, you want to know the worst <laughs> thing about it? Let's hear it. She what? she sacrificed herself, right? Because she didn't want her, and she was like, "Well, me and Asher will have our bond destroyed when, right. we, when this happens. So, like, we we might as well, you know, go out together." Yeah. But then you learn at the end that it doesn't the bond even stop it. It's didn't get life destroyed. Life is different, dude. So she sacrificed oh, herself for that and didn't have to. Yeah, that oh, sucks. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and because Relic has this moment where, like, he, you know, Chris thinks everything's going good, and Relic's like, you don't know the he difference. Or yeah. yeah, he's like, life light and and thread weaving is different. I'm like, oh fucking god, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Dude, yeah, not I, a lot of people notice that or make the connection with Laurel, but yeah. a few yeah. have, and they're like, I made the connection and I hate it <laughs> yeah. so much. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because yeah. uh, yeah, it, it stopped him from uh it stopped him from being able to use like thread light and stuff. Yeah, so they were like able to heal up. Yeah, exactly. They were screwed and they had all the healing power they wanted. Jeez. Uh, I, I have a question for you, yeah. Zach, and I don't know if this is this may have been said, but when Chris, you know, stabs himself in the heart and implants that amber theolith in himself, uses the healing water, he talks about a, the completed theolith or the completed something, but we don't get to see what that does. Is is there something special that happens when that happens? Did I miss something? Or yeah, do we just you, not know? Well, when you have all four theoliths together, um, you are able to see life light. Okay. Uh, and, and manipulate ah, life light. Okay. Gotcha. So kind of. So he didn't even there. have a chance to. Okay. Gotcha. That was my That'd other be... one of my other favorite things to, to write. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was like, it felt like the moment in like progression fantasy, for example, yeah. right? Where like the level up happens. Exactly. And boom, you're about to just like wreck Destroy on somebody. Destroy stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, Chris levels it up. And nope. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I noticed that, and I was like, man, that's like, oh, I just, I wish I could have seen that, but it was still good though. <laughs> Uh, well, speaking of the magic, um, you know, I, I, I did want to ask about, I have a question somewhere. Yeah. What, so what is the difference between life light and thread light? I, I think that may be something that, uh, something that I missed that, so the life light is specific to 
the wastelanders bond with uh relic right yes like it is it is related to that um i don't think it's ever like fully explained yeah, and part of that is like and part of it's because like the only person who really knows about it that they talk to is alcaeus oh, okay. yeah and i was like i could do more info dumps but i feel like there was already quite yeah, a bit of them there yeah <laughs> okay uh, but the the short answer is Threadlight is your connection to non-living things, uh -huh. and Lifelight is your connection to living things, gotcha. including oh, okay. yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's how bonds are created through Lifelight. Okay. And same with like the you know control that uh, Relic does. Okay, so when when they destroyed the bond between Relic and the Wastelanders, did did that remove all Lifelight, or is it still out there? They life light is still out there. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. kind of like your soul. Okay. Kind of, kind of so everybody is. has, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's, yeah, that's you, how you need thread light to create the, to like link specific, to it specifically amber thread light to create like the, the bond. The bond. Okay. The okay. Bond light. And then, uh, and at the end there, he had the cup of, uh, what was that? That he put on the elixir. Baby's, the, the elixir. Yeah. That's the elixir, man. And I was, I was freaking crying. At that scene, dude, I was like seriously oh, so just heartwarming about that yeah. whole entire scene about how yeah. he like he took the extra time. He had this little bit left to reach out to his old friend yeah. and their kid that had been, you know, poured ass. Yeah, dude, I was just yeah. I was like really so happy crying about that. Yeah, seriously. That like I was like, that was one I was of the crying. scenes I was looking forward to right from the beginning. Yes, that was absolutely incredible. Yeah. That was in the seventy percent in the seventy five percent outline. The yeah. original outline. It was so good, <laughs> nice. dude. So good. That's awesome. Oh, thanks. Um, so let's uh let's talk about our favorite things about the the magic system and and how Zach kind of came up with it. I, I think we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, but I, I wanna say one of my favorite things is in um the beginning of Bonds of Chaos, where they they have all the abilities and they're finding ways to use them together and willow figures out how to fly yeah and man i'm like dude that is that is so cool like just felt like i was like oh they sever their you know they they use the obsidian thread light to sever their um core thread and then you know use the other colors to like push and pull I'm like, dude, that is that is such a cool idea. I, I loved everything they were able to do with uh with Obsidian once they once they were able to sever that. Yeah, and in the second book too, there's at one point there's a tree falling towards them, and then she uses like a couple of colors and like pushes this tree off with the colors, and it's kind of the same thing. It was like she's yeah. she she figures it all out first, I feel like. Like she <laughs> knows what's going on, like she's yeah. quick. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Willow's the smarty. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what was it like, Zach? And if you've if you've already answered this and I've forgotten, I'm, you, we can skip it. But <laughs> <laughs> what was it like creating the like sitting down and figuring out the magic system? Yeah, I mean it was it was pretty prescriptive. I I think one thing that I wanted to do was like I didn't want to like do like a basic like elemental kind of thing, yeah. and so I wanted something a little bit more unique. And so like I mentioned, like the idea of these connections was like the base of it. And so really it came down to like, you know, what could you do with these connections? So I was like, okay, you could do push yeah. pull. And then I was like, well, it'd be, you know, really cool if you could like, you know, destroy them. I'm like, what would yeah. that do? Oh, Obsidian. Yeah. Or yeah. create them. What would that do? Yeah. And then I couldn't really think of any other things that you could do with the threads. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Push pull, create, destroy. I was like, well, that's, I mean, that's No, that's good. solid. Yeah, that's yeah. solid. Yeah. And one thing that I did want to, to do is I didn't want the magic to like feel overpowered. I don't know. There's like there's there's cool things about overpowered magic, and then there's other things that you know make it hard to do you know, yeah. storytelling and, and focus on other yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, so I and I and, and especially in like the first book, like the magic is like not super powerful. I'm like there's you know yeah. a couple things you could do with it, but like it's not like you know somebody who has who's, who's a sapphire is going to be immune to somebody who's not. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, there I, was yeah. I I felt that there was always enough challenge within the magic mm -hmm. system for who's using it and all three books of course they get better at it they get more powers but then the challenges get harder and like more continuous and so it was always yeah. it, i never felt like it was overpowered which of course i appreciate i think that's good it was yeah. always just like this continuous 
there's always, always there's always up. something that's a little bit more that they're trying to battle with right there there was this moment in uh in bonds of chaos that i i thought was really cool that i hadn't considered before they were all worried about uh chris walking through uh this area and being too loud and he says, like, if it makes you feel better, I'll use a little sapphire yeah. to, to lighten my feet as I walk. And I was like, oh, that's super cool. Like, I didn't yeah. even think about, like, having that much control to just make yourself weigh, like, a little bit less to make less noise. I thought that was really cool. Okay, so I, I want to move on, but I, I have a question about the bond with, with the Adachan. Hmm. Um, oh. so, <laughs> so I'm... I, I feel like I'm I'm so used to in in fantasy books like whenever there's some sort of ritual bond it's usually like a romantic thing, but it, it didn't seem like that's what it was with uh... Spencer. Are you into gorillas? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. See, that's the thing. And you want to cuddle a gorilla? <laughs> yeah. A little snuggle, snuggle. A little that's... snuggle, snuggle. I mean, who knows? But uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll 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 try anything twice. But. Um... <laughs> But no, I, and that's, I was like, I was like, okay, so this is a, what, what do they get out of the bond as far as like, like they're, it, if one dies, they both die. And then are they sharing powers in the same way that mm -hmm. Laurel and Asher are? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you, you see, you see Suchan get the ability to use obsidian thread weaving due to Alvarax's power. So, oh, okay. I mean, I, yeah, I from what I understand, it's, it's sh in that aspect, it's very much shared the strength, you know, Alvarax gets a portion of the obsidian thread weaving, Sutan gets a portion of, and they can use it in conjunction. And, uh, okay. yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. So let's move on to favorite characters. Um, I guess we'll, we'll start with Zach. Who is your favorite character to write? It depends on yeah. the book. Book two okay. it was definitely Alvarax. I really okay. like yeah. writing him. In book one, I think it was probably Chris. I enjoyed writing him. Although, although I will I'll say the uh, the point of view in book three of Laz. Oh, I, I really enjoyed writing. I don't know like the, the <laughs> dumb little like imagery of him like <laughs> yeah. watching the Wastelander army come and he's like and just squishing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was great. I did like that a lot. I was like, he would do that. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. There's like lots of people in different ways I like a lot. So I, I, I really like people who, you know, are caring. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So whenever there's like a moment, like Alvarex's grandfather, I really love Jacena, yeah. kind of the same thing where like she's very caring and she's like wise also. Like she, Great Lord, like Malchus's wife, I've, I've always thought was super caring and like just willing to help yeah, out. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Gabe? Any favorite characters? So I, I really liked, even in the second book, I, I really liked um, Asher and Laurel, I think is her name. Yeah, Laurel. Sorry, I'm so bad with names. But I loved their bond and seeing how that started. And then seeing them in the second book was pretty cool uh, with kind of how their bond like strengthened and how they were just a team. I love animals. So I'm like always all for a dog. Like, yeah. count me in. It's all it's all there. So they were probably my my fan favorite. Um, Of course, I loved, you know, Chris, like the main character, Aiden was cool seeing how that all played out and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. I, I would say Chris is probably my favorite character with with Alvarax being a a close second. Um, yeah, I guess really, hmm, I don't know. I I I liked Willow a lot. I think yeah. I think Willow had a lot of like really really fantastic moments and uh, she she became so much more than just like the hero's mom, right? Like she, yeah. she had such like a big personality and such a, a, a pivotal role to play at, at certain points. I, I really loved that. No one's favorite character was Jellium. <laughs> okay. So God, you guys are going to hate can we me. Talk about, can we talk <laughs> about hear, that name? Let's yeah. hear what yeah, Spencer let's hear about has the to name. say. Ugh. Let's hear about the name. No, that's all. <laughs> Oh, that's uh, I it. Hate, that's I, it. I, I, hate, the, I hate the name itself. It's just like <laughs> every time I say it, I'm like, ugh. Ooh, gross. <laughs> yeah. Uh okay. So, like I said, I went through Bonds of Chaos really fast. What happened to Jellium? Where did he go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you missed it. I did. 
So when they're at the endless well, when they first get to like the tree line of the endless well, they see all of the statues or like the statue like bodies of the wastelanders, the Pintalamocs have taken them. And uh, they're all like waiting, they're cautious, and they're like, okay, we, we got to get to the end as well. And they're like, okay, well, we got to be careful. And Jellium's like, are we going to go or what? Like, what? Right. <laughs> yeah. So he steps out and he's like, see, it's fine. And then he gets struck by a dart. And then, yeah. you know, a bunch more darts come <sighs> and strike him. But, and but don't, don't they get him to the pool, though? I thought they got him to the pool. They get him to the pool, but he's already dead. Yeah, oh, okay. they, they tried. <laughs> okay. Yep. I had a question about uh, Willow. Is is she the the one on the Bonza Chaos cover? Is that her? Yeah. Nice. Okay. I was curious. Yeah, she's a little bit different than how I imagined her, but it was close enough that I was like, we're good. Sensor's got it. Yeah. Yeah. I I did not expect Roshar to look like that. I I I, I pictured him. <laughs> I I pictured him to be just like a bigger, older version of uh of Alvarax. <laughs> no. Also, I like that you call him Roshar. What? Because you've clearly been reading Stormlight Archive. <laughs> oh, you're right. Roshar. 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 Uh, Which I guess is pretty dang close. <laughs> <laughs> Relic. Relic was just a great bad guy. Yeah, I was and, gonna say let's talk about Relic. And, and I, I love how in the first book, like we don't, we don't really. No, I mean, maybe it's like mentioned as like some bit of foreshadowing or something, but like we really don't know anything about like wastelander gods or anything. We just know that this is like a voice in Chris's head. Um, and I, I, I love how that all like gets revealed that he's like, you know, such a, a bigger thing than, you know, I would have ever thought that he was. Like, I, I assumed that it was some like, you know, some, part of like uh, uh some some traumatic moment that happened to chris in the war that kind of had this like part of his brain that was just like kill hunt like just this part of him that takes over i, I assumed it was magical in nature but i was not expecting it to be like this wastelander god that is like super old and powerful and yeah i, I loved relic yeah there's not really anything in Voice of War that tells you much about him, for sure. Yeah. Like, where's my brother? Right. Yeah. And that's like the only other indication you have that. Right. There's there's somebody else. Right. I and speaking of the the wide brimmed hat, there was a moment in a uh, Bonds of Chaos where, um, where I think it's I'm pretty sure it's Chris. He sees like a a wide brimmed hat on a. Thing, right am i remembering this correctly and it sparks something in his head yeah in, in stones of light too yeah he sees the white broom hat and oh he's was like, it stones of light okay he's like do i know you yeah yeah, yeah. he's like no definitely not <laughs> there's a in, in this the last couple scenes when uh chris and his wife are fighting relic and lilacs there's a point that i i love in any fantasy and it, it it's always something that i enjoy to see where like Chris says something like, and in her eyes, I saw fear, right? Because the point where he's like putting this Amber Thielith in, Lilacs, who's this all powerful god, like gets scared and freaked out. I freaking love those moments, dude, where like uh -huh. the tides are turned, even just for a second. Yeah. And they get terrified. Like, yeah. just that's, yeah, I love it's, that. Yeah. Until, and then the power's gone. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the power's, power's gone. gone. But still, yeah. that moment was like, yeah. it was surreal. It was like really awesome. Yeah. J just that moment where like, relic like puts out his hand and realizes that he can't stop the spear yes and, like we're like uh, they become less than gods even yeah. if it's for a second like that's yeah. super awesome it was so good <laughs> that was that was one of the scenes where like it was very vivid in my mind yeah as I read it. yeah it and seemed like, that, that way that, reading it like i would love to like see that yeah like, yeah portrayed like in like a movie or something like that's yes. like one of the scenes like i would love to see that yep yeah yeah that was that was one of the scenes where like Usually when I'm listening to an audiobook, I'm either like I, I have to like multitask at all times. So like <laughs> I'm either working or driving or like playing a video game or something and listening. <laughs> and that scene was was one of the ones where I like paused the video game and just sat in my chair and like <laughs> listen just, to just, it. just listen to it. It's it going so, down. That's it was, right. It was Stuff's so happening. Intense. Yeah. 
Um, all right, favorite moments. Uh, so we we already asked Zach like what was his favorite uh, favorite parts to write, but feel free to chime in with with any other favorite moments. Um, Gabe, what were some of yours when you look back on the trilogy and you you think about you know the scenes? Yeah, that stand so out? so I think since I'm just a sucker for these emotional moments, is when Chris met with his old lieutenant i don't know the guy his baby remember he put stuff on his eyes what is that guy's name oh luther yeah luther okay so he goes to this farmhouse where he's being housed by um laz's cousin laz's cousin thank you (laughs) dude i'm so bad i'm so sorry but there's a lot of names yeah and so when he does that whole scene and how that was just like probably my favorite scene because of how like emotional it was um of course the time travel was a trip that was like almost unexpected but also at the same time like oh my gosh like that's what happened you know like yeah that was there yeah yeah those probably my two favorite scenes i would think yeah we we talked about uh willow saving chris in in stones of light and that dude that is just like absolutely one of my like top three favorite scenes i think just like that moment where you're like chris is completely fucked like he (laughs) there is no way out for him like he's so screwed and then willow just comes like flying Flying in in, and takes him down the down the rabbit hole it's just awesome that's a hard one too because i was like i don't want it to like be too out of the blue so i had to like i actually like went back and i was like let's have people ask about where's willow where's willow (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, i i think it worked really well because we get a bunch of scenes of her kind of like along the way and we see her like making her way to chris so that when she gets there it doesn't feel like where the hell did you come from but uh, another another one of my favorite scenes is uh where (laughs) where willow is like breaking out of the keep and she's pretending to be like an old lady and the guards where's are my all, cat? yeah, <laughs> yeah. Where's my cat? and she like the guards are all like confused and then she just launches out of there oh, yeah. and like takes <laughs> off and they're like what oh it was so good <laughs> that's great oh one of my one of my other favorite scenes um it's i mean so i love like the ending scenes for the for all of them like laurel's final scene with asher like when they're like you know given their like final moments i like really like that yeah alvarax when he's like when it all goes down and the wastelanders all sacrifice themselves yeah and he's there and it's like him and his dad and like some wastelander children like crying yeah. basically like out there by themselves and he's like and alvarax drops down onto his knees and he's like i'm a wastelander too like i yeah. i should join them yeah and so he like tries to give it up and then he's like i can't i don't yeah. have yeah. that ability yeah my you know my sacrifice is to live with theirs yeah. And I, I really like that. No, that's, that's great. good too. So, so did Oh yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna ask, so so the Wastelanders have always had this ability to is there a name for it? Like that whole sequence of them kneeling and giving themselves is they call it the Pentolomox, yeah. Pentolomox, okay. And because so, they in the beginning they thought it was a plague, like sickness, right, that went through. But in yeah. reality it's not. It's a choice that they make. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's a defense mechanism for their hive okay gotcha. right? if somebody gets sick they would send them out and that they would they would do that themselves okay you know? gotcha oh chris and ariel getting their son out of the church in the first book and the the zedalum priest helping them like get through the monastery yeah. and telling them to go to the fair and wild and then uh chris finding out that he is uh part of the zedalum people that was that was a and it was his uncle yeah. yeah oh yeah and that was his uncle that's right what was yeah. his name i want to hand father zaitlin yeah 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 that was fantastic that was that was one where there's there's a scene that like i don't know i don't know if anyone's doing like rereads or anything but like when chris first goes and he's like going through like all of the documents at the temple he's like looking through and he's like man you know sometimes i think it'd be really nice to like you know meet some of my family and then father Dalen walks in yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah. But like, how may I help you chris i just like yeah. i wrote it and i was like the irony yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> that's awesome that's great that's great in uh in stones of light alvarax 
giving his life for the Zedalum, like taking the blame. And oh man, that was just such a good scene where he's just like he's willing to die for them because if he doesn't, then they would they would possibly get blamed. And he's just got like all these like stones on him. They're putting stone after stone. And she finally realizes that he's telling the truth, like that he wasn't yeah. the one that that killed the uh, the Empress. And then he just like cuts the core threads of all the stones and they float up. Dude, that was such a fantastic scene. I love that. Yeah. That was my didn't... my Spartacus moment. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> love yeah. it. I, I think for yours. Yep. I think that this is in book two or maybe even book one. I'm not sure, but it's when uh, Alabella basically takes her blood thieves out to the Farren Wild to burn down the Zedalum tribe. Yeah, um, book, yeah. Not yeah, not a not a good scene per se. Very impactful though when she yeah. breaks the core seal. That that whole entire sequence was like yeah, pretty pretty strong. Yeah. Um, yeah, when all the threads come together. Yes, exactly. Aldrax, Laurel and Chris are all doing their thing. Yeah. Um, and then the ending, of course, we get uh, yeah. you know, Laurel and Asher are dead, thanks Zach. Um, and <laughs> and in a uh, better place. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and then uh, Rosha and Willow are together, and then Alvarax has found. <laughs> uh a zedalum lady right oh it doesn't doesn't say if, if she's from oh okay. zedalum or not yeah just she, and, he found and, a girl yeah they're starting and, a thing maybe right and and they're they're building uh since that that core seal is gone they're they're building like a stair set up to the city right that was mm -hmm. really cool um and then to the uh, laurel wood yeah yep oh yeah i guess renamed that's right and Chris becomes great lord and then hands it off to Malicus' wife right away. I thought that was cool. They're like, yeah, you can't give it to her. Like, we're, we want you to do it. And he's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> First order yeah. of business. Yep, yeah. that's right. It's going to her now. <laughs> yeah, why? So why didn't he want to take that uh, that title? Was he just like, I've just been through hell? And Well, I think I he just knew that he wasn't he wasn't what they needed caring and what you know somebody that understood what was going on and he just he wasn't that and correct me if i'm wrong that's what i read off of but yeah absolutely right you know. it's nice um, when other people can answer the question i'm like okay yeah. <laughs> yeah. great awesome <laughs> do you have any sort of like head canon for for what happens with these people next like where do they end up in life do you have any sort of like I don't know. <laughs> He's like, reaching. He's what, reaching as far as he can. Yeah, what what happens to everybody? <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I was just living like a happy life. I guess that's a solid answer. That's like that's all you need though, you yeah. know. Happy ending, man. Yeah. In my head Except for Laurel. This <laughs> Ariel have another child. Oh, okay. cool. And I actually I I considered writing that. I considered like changing, you know, how the ending happened and instead of like the Laurel would being a thing. And I was like, maybe Chris and Ariel, they named their daughter Laurel. Laurel. Or something. Oh yeah. yeah. I would have, uh, no. I, I would have shit myself if they had a second kid and the, the kid like opens its eyes and it's got like thread light. I'm like, <laughs> what's happening? You're like, this is crazy. It's I'm back. Just, I'd be so excited. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I mean, that was, so, that was kind of, if I were to go back, there is the opening there, right? We're like, yeah. they destroyed the provenance, but, you know, will the provenance return? Right. It totally, yeah. totally could. And yep. then what happens if people, if that starts popping up again in the world? For sure. Yeah, because, so. because you have uh, people's core threads. Like when Alvarax is first messing around with his powers, he like cuts his core thread and he starts freaking out because it's gone. He's and he's like, is it ever going to come back? And then it like kind of, you know, over time it. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I kind of wonder if the, uh, if the provenance would do the same thing, if it would work in the same way where it gets cut off, it dies off for a hundred years or something and comes back. Yeah. Quite possibly. Maybe. Quite possibly. Does? So does it. No uh, comment. Yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> um, so does the, does the provenance like does it affect like this whole world because i'm sure there's parts of this world that we didn't get to see in in these books 
it, is it just affecting like this area where all these thread weavers are or in other parts of the world are there thread weavers as well it affected the whole world okay oh, yeah we we only we only explored that one continent also okay yeah um all right well i think uh i think that's all i have as far as final thoughts um like i said earlier i, I definitely think this is a a series that you know, you can recommend to just about anybody. I think it's a great like beginner series. I've thought about handing my mom's it. book club read it. That's nice. Right. Tell me That's about awesome. that. That's awesome. Yeah, tell They're me about that. They're all in their sixties or, <laughs> or higher. Yeah, and they've been together. They've been a book club for twenty years. Wow. They've never done any fantasy books before. Oh wow. And then yeah, they invited me down. I had dinner with all of them, and they talked <laughs> to me about Voice of War. I was a little bit worried about it because there's like a torture scene in Voice of War. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, they enjoyed it. Several of them like read the rest of the series. And... Oh, really? Cool. That's yeah, awesome. so awesome. As far dude. as like intro to fantasy goes, like, yeah, it's definitely, definitely can be that. Yeah, that's awesome. I've, I've thought about getting a couple copies and handing it to some of my family at Christmas because there, there's a couple of, a couple of people in my family that I think would really, really enjoy this. I, I support that behavior right yep. yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right well we've talked about you know what you're what you're working on next so i think uh i think that's about it man thank you thank you so much for yeah. joining us and staying up late and chatting about Threadlight. it's been a ton of fun yeah thanks you guys yeah we'll have to uh try to get you over to our barnes and noble here next year i'm gonna come man i'm yeah. seriously i'm there Make i'm there yeah, let me let me know. I'll take a uh, I'll take an Amtrak up there. I felt so bad that I couldn't come to your signing. Like I was, I was keeping track of like when the signing was, and I was so excited for it. And then I realized, like I honestly, I kind of moved out here at the last minute. Like it was it was kind of like there was like a three week window where I was like, okay, I'm going, and I just kind of went and. As soon as I got here, I was like, oh, I'm missing Zach signing like right now. I wanted to be there so bad. But I've yeah, been def- holding it against you ever since. I know, That's right. I know. How dare you? I I <laughs> felt the distance growing between us. <laughs> I knew that was why. Um, yeah, definitely let us know when that is. We'd love to come out. Yeah, that'd be awesome. All right, guys. Well, we are going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much for hanging out with us while we talk about the Threadlight Trilogy with Zach Argyle. We'll have all his stuff linked below in the description, so be sure to follow him at those links. Um, Our next episode will likely be a Creator's Corner episode where we go off topic with Craig from the Legendarium podcast. And I think our... I think our next big book episode will be a mis- will be the Mistborn Era 2 discussion uh, as we have the Lost Metal coming out in just a couple days from the time of this recording. So definitely stay tuned for that. Get notified for those by hitting those subscribe and bell icons down below. You can also follow us on Twitter at Files Fantasy for our extremely professional opinions on books, movies, <laughs> and video games. Uh, Thanks for watching, and until next time, I'm going to grab some popcorn and watch Gabe try to dig his way out of my basement with a plastic spoon. Goodbye.